<laughs> hey, what is going on everyone? It's me, Mr. Mario, and a little bit of a different video here because yes, this is going to be Xbox 360 and RGH related. However, I'm actually going to be showing a glitch chip method here for the Xbox 360. We do have a fat system right here, which this one I've used a bit as a guinea pig, but this here is going to be covering RGH 1.2 for the Xbox 360. Now, why would I recommend and why am I making a video over RGH 1.2 when we have the absolutely lovely RGH 3 available, which doesn't require a glitch chip, it doesn't require fiddling around with wiring methods, wire routing, or even been messing around with, I don't know, different timing files and such. Well, I'm going to be showcasing this here for the FAT systems because RGH3 is great, mind you, but it is actually not necessarily recommended for the FAT systems just in terms of it being not only in beta, but also being unstable. I have spoken with Octal quite a bit about this, and really the long short of it is if you are going to be using RGH3 on a FAT system, you might run into issues or it might be perfectly fine, but it is so unpredictable with how it works. You might have a system that works perfectly, you might have a system that works perfectly for like three weeks and then it stops glitching. You might have a system that glitches unreliably, or you might have a system that just doesn't take RGH3 at all. And when it comes to fat systems, unfortunately, it's just a bit unpredictable, which is why I am showcasing and recommending here RGH 1.2 for fat systems if you want something which is tried and true and stable. I have also made a video covering RGH 1.2 years ago, but I do want to make this video to supersede that one because not only I am better at my craft here, but RGH 1.2 has come a long way. There's different tricks, different methods now, and even I guess this is RGH 1.2 version 2, I guess you can say. So that is why I am making a video right now covering RGH 1.2 for anybody who might be confused. Plus, this is coming out before the RGH 3 video, so there will be an RGH 3 video on the way, but if anybody is kind of iffy about RGH 3 on their FAT systems and they want something more solid, proven, long-term, successful, RGH 1.2 is still a tried and true method for these FAT systems. With all that being said, let me reintroduce myself. Hey, what's going on everyone? It's me, Mr. Mario, and in this video here, we are going to be revisiting RGH 1.2, and we're going to be installing one of these right here, a Cool Runner Revision C, into an Xbox 360 such as this. Now, this is going to require a few things, and I am going to get into the long short of it here, but first of all, we do have to identify which console we have. So this video is going to be covering fat systems. If you have a slim system, it would be recommended if you're going to rely on or if you want to use a glitch chip, it would be recommended to do RGH 1.2. If you do not want to use a glitch chip, you could do RGH 3 on a slim system. However, for a fat system, this is going to work on many of them, but not all of them. And you're going to have to check your motherboard. On screen, I am going to have a diagram showing how you can check your motherboard revision. And I am also going to let you all know that the ones that will work for this are going to be Falcon motherboards, Opus motherboards, because those are Falcon motherboards without HDMI, as well as Jasper motherboards. If you have a Xenon or a Zephyr system, this video unfortunately is not going to be for you, and RGH 1.2 really is not going to work for that. Using something such as external clock, like EXT underscore CLK, will work for those systems. However, if you have a FAT system, this is really only going to be limited to Falcon motherboards, Opus motherboards, which again are the same as Falcons, and Jasper motherboards. Now, how can you check your motherboard revision? Well, you need to take your Xbox 360, disconnect it from power, and we are going to check the power plug around the back of the console. Again, you will need to refer to that on-screen diagram and then look at your power plug here in a good light. Now, as you can see, this power plug here denotes this console is a Falcon motherboard, and I know it is a Falcon because this console also has HDMI on it. So that means this console is a good contender for RGH 1.2. Again, if you have a FAT system, this is really only going to be for Falcon motherboards, 
Opus motherboards and Jasper motherboards. It's going to be limited to those three, but don't worry, there's plenty of those out in the wild. Now, in order to perform RGH 1.2 on one of these systems, there will be a few prerequisites we need to cover. And first of all, of course, you will need your Xbox 360. I'm going to show you the tools and such you will need, but this is also going to assume that you have the skill set and the basics and such, and all the things that you'll really need to do proper soldering on one of these consoles. So as I usually say, this video is not going to teach you how to solder. If you do watch this video and you pick up a few things, that is fantastic, that is awesome, but this video is going to assume there will be some basics you have as a viewer following along with this to properly solder and such and perform all the modifications we need here, but I will show you some extra things that we'll need. First of all, because this is going to require a glitch chip, you will need, well, an actual glitch chip. Now, the one that I am going to be using here is going to be the Cool Runner Revision C, and I'm going to be using this just because this has been recommended for the RGH 1.2 mod. Yes, there are going to be other glitch chips you can use, such as a Matrix or even a Ace chip, uh, but I'm still sticking with the Cool Runner chips. The other thing you will need to know is that, yes, pretty much all the Cool Runner Rev C's out there are going to be clones, but they're going to perform just as fine as regular ones. It's just the regular Cool Runner Rev C's haven't been in circulation for a long, long time. So even this one here is a clone one, but this will work for what we need it for. So I will be using a Cool Runner Rev C for this installation, and that is what I'm going to be showcasing on this. Now, you are also going to need a NAND programmer, and this is where uh, I guess it'll be a little bit controversial, but I'll go ahead and show the NAND program recommendations and why. Now, if you're asking for my recommendations in 2022 and beyond, I still recommend the X Flasher 360. This here is a pretty much all-in-one really awesome hardware tool for programming the Xbox 360's internals created by Element from the mod shop. Now, for full disclosure, this was sent over to me a while ago for free just to use on the channel, showcasing videos, review and all that fun stuff, but him sending this over is not going to influence my opinion on it. And my opinion on this is, this is really the best flasher out there for the Xbox 360. It is a fantastic piece of hardware, and I have enjoyed using it quite a bit. I have recommended it, and that is why I still recommend this thing going forward, using the X Flasher 360. However, I do know that it is a little bit hard to find and such, so... This is the main one I'm going to be recommending. Other people might be bringing up the Pico Flasher, but there's a little bit of a caveat here, and I will get into this. I'm going to put this over to the side, and this is the other one I've been talking about and I have mentioned. This is a Raspberry Pi Pico, but internally it is flashed with a firmware called Pico Flasher. And Pico Flasher has been created by Balika011, a fantastic, pretty awesome person, and also friend of the channel here. Now, this is a really great budget programmer. Not only you can get a Raspberry Pi Pico pretty easily and pretty affordably, but it's super easy to install Pico Flasher on here, and all, really all you need to do is solder up some wires to the chip here, and then solder them to the appropriate points on your motherboard, and you can use this on JRunner and such. So that is great to have on hand. However, the reason why I'm a little bit hesitant recommending this here is, well, since this is RGH 1.2, there is going to be a glitch ship. And to my knowledge, it looks like Pico Flasher does not have support for flashing a glitch chip on it. So you can use Pico Flasher to read and write and modify the NAND of the Xbox 360. However, you are going to need to typically flash a programming or timing file to your glitch chip because typically these glitch chips do arrive blank. And that is where the X Flasher 360 will come into play. Not only it will serve as a NAND flasher, but it can also flash glitch chips as well too. This is really what you need it for. Not only you will need to flash your NAND on the console itself, but you'll also need another cable like this. You hook it up here to the X Flasher, and then at least on this, you take the smooth side, face it up, and you connect it like here. You have to make sure this is all connected to your computer. You are going to have to also force this into programming mode. And then at this point, you use the X flasher to flash the timing file onto the glitch chip itself. Once it has been flashed over, you can switch it back, 
disconnect this, and then you can work on getting this installed on your console. But you also might have to mess with other timings on here, because since this is going to be a more timing-based modification, every console is going to be a little bit different in terms of wiring, wire placement, and even picking a glitch timing file on here. So that is why I'm saying it's still going to be really good to have something like this, the X Flasher 360. And while as the Pico Flasher is a fantastic piece of kit here for flashing the Xbox 360's NAND and such, unfortunately, it's not going to help us with the glitch chip itself. So just keep that in mind. Do I recommend the Pico Flasher? Yes, I do. But do I recommend it for RGH 1.2? Unfortunately, it's not going to allow us to flash the glitch chip, so that is where the issue is going to be. But if you want something that will flash the glitch chip and the NAND and such, the X Flasher 360 is really going to be your best bet. If you've modified Xbox 360s in the past, you might have something like this laying around, which would be one of the older, I guess I call them legacy flashers. This is the NAND X, but you might also have something such as a Matrix flasher. And the reason why I'm not really covering or even recommending these is just because they are old, they're outdated, there's better, you know, flashers and such out on the market now, but also they're just a bit more cumbersome to set up with newer operating system installs just because the drivers are not signed. There's extra hoops that you're going to have to jump through to get one of these set up here. If you want to take one of these flashers, such as if you have a NAND flasher and you want to set it up and then adapt the tutorial to the NAND X, you can certainly do that. I'm not going to stop you, but when it comes to recommendations from myself, in 2022 and beyond, I am recommending the X Flasher 360 as I have been recommending for the past several videos I've covered using RGH. And again, I do also recommend the Pico Flasher. It's just in this instance, it won't allow us to flash a timing file over to the glitch chip itself. So for RGH 1.2, it is a little bit more difficult to recommend this here, but the X Flasher will do all of that for you. With that hardware out of the way, the other stuff we are going to need, or at least I recommend, is first going to be some good flux. Now, everyone's going to have, you know, their own options and I guess own choices for flux. Like if you want to use like liquid no clean flux, that's up to you. For these installs, I still use my Kingbo flux I've had for several years and it's this type, this RMA218 flux. The Kingbo might be a little bit harder to find these days, but if you can find some good RMA218, as long as it is proper electronics flux, it's not going to be like plumbing flux or something, uh, then it works out pretty well for this, but the Flux will really help you out, help your install, and it really does go a long way. So I still recommend using Flux for these installations. The cool thing is with these glitch chips is they do come with their own wiring, so you don't have to go out and get additional wiring. However, if you do want to purchase some wires or just, you know, use your own for different reasons, I do still recommend this 30 gauge, I guess, solid or single core wrapping wire or Kynar wire wire, whatever you're going to call it. The reason why I recommend this stuff is not only the 30 gauge, it is small, it's easy to loop through to different places, you can really train it real well, but on top of that, because it is going to be a solid piece, and make sure it is like solid core or a solid piece inside, it's just like one piece there, you don't have to worry about stranding with wires and such. So I do like to use this stuff here, this 30 gauge wrapping wire, wire wrapping wire, Kynar wire, whatever you're going to be calling it there. You aren't just limited to this, and if you want to, you can just use the wires that typically come with a glitch chip. Nothing is going to stop you there. You can even go higher on this. You can go like 28 gauge or 26 gauge on there, and you can even use stranded wires. But for this install, I am going to be showing myself using this type of wire right here. Why? Because I just prefer it for a few reasons, but that's totally up to you. Now to get things cleaned up here, I do like to use isopropyl alcohol. Now you can pick up a few types. Uh, typically in stores, I find 91% isopropyl alcohol. This stuff I ordered online and it is 99% isopropyl alcohol, but having some alcohol like this, just isopropyl alcohol to clean up not only the points that we're going to solder to, but just the console in general is really going to help us out. Since I've talked about cleaning here, in addition to the isopropyl alcohol, there's really two other things I use for cleaning. First of all is some Q-tips, just cleaning everything up with the isopropyl alcohol and Q-tips, and also just for some general areas and even really small areas and nooks and crannies that we can't super easily get into with Q-tips, 
a toothbrush helps out. Now don't just grab like your old toothbrush that you've been using to brush your teeth. I would recommend getting a new toothbrush or just a toothbrush that hasn't been used or that you're only using for electronics cleaning and repair. But Q-tips and a toothbrush. They help out. To secure our wires down, since we will require wires for this installation, people seem to differ on this here, but I personally like Captain Tape. You can use electrical tape, which I used to use and I don't use anymore. It's really just not that good long term, since it kind of just rots and doesn't look all too nice long term. But uh, other people also use hot glue. I'm personally not a fan of hot glue, just a personal thing, but I do like Captain Tape. It works real well, it's real clean, it's easy enough to use, and uh, it helps out with securing wires to the motherboard, so I am going to recommend Captain Tape. Since we're going to be inside and cleaning up the system, this is not going to be required, but I am going to recommend this in terms of maintenance. Let's face it, these systems are getting old, so it would really go a long way in terms of longevity and just keeping everything nice and clean and working real well to remove the X clamps on the bottom of the motherboard so we can remove the CPU and GPU heat sinks and get all the old thermal paste removed and get some nice fresh thermal paste applied. And for this here, I do like to recommend the X clamp removal tool. Now I've been using one of these tools for about 10 years at this point and let me tell you I've been using it for pretty much every 360 I've worked on as well as Xbox One systems and these things are great. There's good reasons why I refuse to remove X clamps without one of these here. Uh, it's easier, faster, safer. It's really just a better experience removing X clamps and putting them back on if you have the X clamp removal tool. So I am going to recommend something like this. Also for removing the old thermal paste and such, I do use this, which if you've worked on 360s back in the day, you're probably familiar with this here. I still use it, it works well enough. If you wanna use something like isopropyl alcohol, you can, but personally, I use the one-two punch of Arctic Clean. It works super well removing that old stuck-on thermal paste from the console itself. So Arctic Clean works real nice for my needs. And for applying fresh thermal paste, the thermal paste that I use is from Arctic and it is the MX4 variant. Yes, there's probably better stuff out there. In fact, I know there is, but there's also worse stuff out there as well too. And for me and for the Xbox 360, MX4 has worked out incredibly well. So these are the things that I use in order to remove old thermal paste and put some new stuff on. To get into the console itself, you are also going to need, and well, it would be recommended to have an electronic toolkit of some kind. Even even if you don't have a toolkit like this, there's going to be two or three bits that you will need. And I can show you here. You will need a, this thing always comes off and everything. You know, let's try this again. You will need a couple bits here. One of them being a T8 security bit and you'll also need a T10 security bit. So this is really going to be to tear down the system. But to actually get inside of there as well too, we're also going to need something like a small flat head bit like this, just in order to pop the tabs around the back of the system. So having a T8, T10, and even if you just have like an old, you know, flathead screwdriver, something that is small enough to get into the tabs around the back of the system, those are going to help you get inside the system. I really haven't shown this up until now, and I'm not going to showcase it in the video, but I think it is worth at least showing here. Uh, I've used this for quite a while. I end up getting one of these probably at least oh, well over 10 years ago with a DVD drive that I had gotten to replace in a 360. But right here, this is a Xbox 360 opening tool. It's not super proprietary, it's not even required for this, but I will show you the nice thing about it is not only you can use this to poke the grates here to take off the sides of the console, but this is great to pop all of these tabs, like these two tabs at the same time and these five tabs at the same time. This is just so convenient. So I'm not going to be showcasing this because I'm aware most people are not going to use these. They're not going to purchase these. They're just going to use like a small flat screwdriver bit or a older screwdriver to pop the tabs around the back. But if you feel like being a little bit fancy, you might want to pick up one of these opening tools. They are uh, pretty useful for popping all the tabs at once around the back of the system. With all that being said here, I think we're finally ready to open up one of these systems and get to glitching it. So go ahead, grab your tools, make sure you have everything you're going to need somewhere safe, somewhere you can easily grab it whenever it is needed, and we're going to rip one of these apart.
with your console completely powered off and disconnected from anything such as power or AV, you're going to want to come over to the top or side and pop off the hard drive like so. Next up, you're going to come to the front of the console and we need to remove the faceplate. You can just use your fingernails to pop it off here, kind of start in the corners, but it should come off pretty easily just like that. Now grab a tool or bit that can fit through these small holes that you see on the sides of the system. We're going to need to release six tabs. First of all, let's work on the left grate. You're going to want to go to the side near the eject button of the DVD drive and kind of pull up on this piece of plastic. Typically, there's two tabs there that release easy enough with just a little bit of force. Next, these two tabs up at the top near the middle and back, you can kind of just poke like that and then wiggle that around and release the actual plastic piece. When you flip the console upside down, you're going to want to pop the tab here in the middle to release that, and five tabs should now be released out of six. There's a sixth one that's going to be hiding underneath the rubber pad at the back of the system, but typically what I do with the other five removed is I kind of just pull up on it like so, and once I'm able to pull it with enough force, you're able to remove the tab and most of the time it's fine, it still stays in place, it does not break. Let's do the same to the bottom grate right here. What I do is just starting on the bottom, you can kind of come here, and these ones are easier to see, but near the front and middle and back, you're going to see some tabs. Just simply take your tool, release them, and pull up a little bit. Come now here to the other side and you can do the exact same thing. Near the front, middle, and back of the console, there's going to be the plastic tabs that you'll see kind of through the holes here. You just need to look at them in the light, and sometimes a whole bunch of other tabs are going to come with it. I'm kind of pointing them out right there, but that one came off super easily. Now around the back of the console, there's going to be seven tabs that you're going to need to pop using either that opening tool or using a small and thin flat bit. There's going to be two that are going to be near the power port up top, and I'm sorry it's just off camera here, but there's going to be indentions that you'll be able to see. What you'll need to do is you're going to need to pop the two tabs that are within those indentions, and you'll be able to separate the case at this point here. You might have to use a little bit of force, but as you can see, it was able to release. Typically, once I have the bottom two released, I then come up to the top and I work on the final five. The same thing right here, you're just going to want to come in here, you're going to want to release all of them, it might take a few tries, and you're typically able to then separate the casing at this point. You might have to feel around for it a bit, but as you can see, it should look a little something like this once you have the bottom half of the case separated. Now coming to the front of the console yet again, there should probably be a warranty sticker right here, which you can remove however you'd like to. I don't really remove it cleanly, I'm just taking it off like so, but there's going to be four latches that we're going to have to pop off or unlatch here. You can see they're going to be at the bottom of the system, the very top of the system right there, and there's going to be two around the middle. Just use either a tool or your hands and fingernails in order to pop these off. You might want to be a little bit careful with these because they could get damaged, but as you can see, once you pop them off, you're able to remove the bottom half of the system completely. You can take the bottom half of the system, remove it, and put it somewhere you can find it. You don't want to lose that. Next up, this piece is easy enough. That's the eject button, just remove it like this and keep it somewhere safe. You're now going to want your T10 security bit, and there's going to be six long screws that you're going to remove. I pointed them out right there, but just remove these six long screws. Once they're all removed, you should be able to flip the console right side up, and at this point, you can gently lift up on the top of the console right here to show the innards. Now, if it's not coming off easily, you might have to just kind of go around the system and loosen up a bit. Also, make sure that you have removed that eject button, but as you can see, we now have access to the DVD drive along with at least seeing most of the motherboard here. Well, the top half of it. Let's go ahead and get that DVD drive removed. Typically what I do is since there's some tabs that are on the front sides of the DVD drive, I kind of gently wiggle it and loosen it out of place 
and from there, move it to the side, disconnect the two cables around the back of it, and then keep this somewhere safe. Since it's going to be easier to work with a clean motherboard later on, you can also just remove these cables as well too. Just for the power cable, make sure you put it back in properly or else you're going to fry your drive. From here, you can also remove the fan shroud. So you can pop the tab in the top middle of it. But typically what I also do is you can even kind of just wiggle it around a bit like that, kind of bend it in, and it will typically release. So we have more clearance and access to everything now. Now for the fans, you're going to have to remove the fans and also disconnect them from the motherboard, but you might notice the connection is a little bit tight there. So sometimes if I'm having issues with that, what I do is I kind of just do a little something like this. You can bend up the top a little bit and you don't even have to use any tools, just kind of use your hands and a little bit of force here. You don't want to be destructive. You can use one hand to keep the fans held down and use another hand to kind of pull up on the metal just ever so slightly so this way you can loosen them and once they are loosened you can pull them a bit forward like this you can then gently remove them from the rest of the components here and at this point you have much more clearance to disconnect your fans with pretty much all the moving parts removed at this point we can now flip the console upside down yet again and then remove all of the remaining T10 screws. They're going to be all around the edge of this, and as you can see, they're going to be much smaller, so you shouldn't mix up these smaller ones with the really long ones that we pulled back a few minutes ago. With all of the T10 screws removed, let's focus on the RF board. Here, we're going to need to remove three screws, but just take this plastic piece covering the LEDs, pop it off, and keep it over to the side. Now grab a T8 security bit and remove the three black screws holding in the RF board. Just easy enough here, loosen them up, remove them, and at this point, you can then easily disconnect the RF board. We're almost done here, flipping this upside down yet again, Right around where the X's are, there's going to be eight T8 security screws that you're going to have to remove. Easy enough, just remove all eight of these. And by the way, if you do not have these screws here, well, that might spell some doom and gloom for your 360. In short, there might have been a bolt mod done to repair this at one point, meaning this console might have had a red ring of death before. And in short, it's just not great for the console. But if you do have all of these screws here, that is a good sign, but we still need to remove them for the time being. Once they're all removed, flip the console right side up. Now gently grab the heatsink and you can kind of pull out the motherboard like that, move the chassis over to the side, and here we go. We now have the motherboard to work with. This thing also really needs a cleaning. Now this step is going to be optional yet recommended. Again, these consoles are old and dirty. So for this, we're going to work on replacing the thermal paste. And for this, we're going to have to remove these X clamps. What you can do if you're using the X clamp removal tool is kind of come in like this. You're going to want to go into the middle of where the X clamp is holding onto each peg here. You don't want to be on top of the X clamp or underneath it, but kind of in the middle, you're going to want to go about halfway. And then you're going to want to apply some pressure and just kind of bend in and lift up like that easy enough. However, you might notice since there's two right next to each other, you might run into this little awkward maneuver like this, where as you can see, I mean, I'm just kind of demonstrating, I'm trying to get it in there, but you're not going to get it in there at this point. So typically what I do is I'm able to remove the two over on the side for one of the X clamps, and then you can kind of just finagle and move the X clamp around a bit like this. If you're able to move it around just enough, you'll be able to pop it off one of the third pegs or legs, and then at that point you can just completely remove it from the final one. So here we go, once you're able to release that first X clamp, you're going to want to gently lift up on the motherboard and remove that heatsink like so, and now we have much easier access to the second X clamp. Optimally, what I like to do is work on one of the legs just like that, pop it in about halfway, lift up, then go to the complete opposite side and do the same thing there. It does make it much easier seeing it at this vantage point, but as you can see, halfway, lift it up like so, 
then you can work on any of the other two. Typically, you should be able to get the third one with some ease as well, and then the fourth one pops off super easy. And at this point now, you can also remove that second heatsink. You might have to push down on the pegs just a little bit, but as you can see, we now have a naked Xbox 360 motherboard. So here's where I come in with the one-two punch of the Arctic Clean Thermal Paste Remover. Now, you can use different things. You don't have to use Arctic Clean. You could also use isopropyl alcohol or anything else that does work for this. But typically what I do with the Arctic Clean is I come in here to both the CPU and GPU dies and put a bit on here. And I also do the same thing on the CPU and GPU heat sinks kind of just be a bit generous with it, but a little bit of this stuff goes a long way. From here, I typically wait several minutes before I remove it. I waited about a minute here, but it's easier to start off with the heat sinks. So just come in, remove the thermal paste off of the heat sinks. It might be really stuck on there, but usually it's not all too bad to get a lot of it off in the first run here. And if you don't get all of it off, don't worry. You might have to do this two, three, maybe even four times when you're hitting this with the number one solution, which is going to be the remover if you're going to be using art to clean. But like I said, I just come in here with a paper towel, work on removing these from the heat sinks themselves, and typically the first time around, if you let it sit for long enough, it does a good enough job. Now after a bit longer, I came over to the CPU and GPU heat sinks, and what I did was just come in with a Q-tip this time around, and you really don't want to handle this with all too much force because there's a lot of small components on here. But I just use a little bit, a little bit of force to really push off the really gunked together stuff like this. But then on the actual tops of the dies, you just want to be gentle with kind of spreading around, removing it and taking it completely off of this here. It doesn't look super good right now, but I'm not too worried about this. Again, we're going to have to do this a few times especially on the dies but you can kind of just come in here break up the big stuff like so and get as much as you can off of here but be prepared to do this again after a bit of work with a first pass here as you can see it looks a little bit something like this which is better but not super great so we're going to hit this another time with the removal solution now what you're looking at is a second pass where i applied the removal solution yet again and the cpu is looking pretty good but the gpu is still looking to the point where it's looking better than it was but i know we can also do a better job getting this all removed here so don't worry just go ahead do this as many times as you need to once you're at a point where you feel pretty comfortable with the old thermal paste being removed you can now come in with the purifier if you're using art to clean put it on the heat sinks and put it on the cpu and gpu right here to get it all nice and purified same thing here typically i just wait a few minutes and then i clean it off cleaning it off of the cpu and gpu as well as the heat sinks is going to be about the same of course use different paper towels and or q-tips or whatever else you're going to be using here and it's to a pretty good point i'm pretty happy with this overall now you do want the dyes to be nice and clean but if you're going to run into this issue here where you're going to notice that inside or kind of near or in between those components next to the dies there's still some old thermal paste don't worry i'm going to show you how you can remove that real quick you can shine a light or kind of shine this in the light here a bit and the dies are looking pretty good for the most part but at this point i do want to completely take off that old thermal paste including inside of those little components there next to the dies so what i do here is well remember that toothbrush i mentioned earlier well, what I do is I just take an old toothbrush that I really only use for electronics, I spray it down with some 99% isopropyl alcohol, and then I come in here and I brush the components. That really helps out because it does clean it up a little bit more since it's 99% isopropyl alcohol, but the toothbrush also really helps to fully remove 
all of that old thermal paste and some of the little tiny crevices that a Q-tip simply can't get to. Be careful, you do not want to use really any force to this. You just want to lightly brush it here, but you're going to see that you're going to get it all nice and clean and any little bits of thermal paste from the old thermal paste is going to be dislodged pretty easily. Once you're all finished up, you can kind of shine a light to your work here and the CPU and GPU dies should be nice and shiny, just like that. If they look like this, fantastic job. You're now ready for new thermal paste. Now for the thermal paste, everyone has their own way of applying it. I kind of apply a bit like this here on the CPU, and then I am going to admit on the GPU here, it got a little bit messy, but you know what? It works out well enough because it's all going to get squished here. I'm going to show that as well too. If you want to spread it, you're more than welcome to do that. However, I've typically noticed with the Xbox 360, I kind of just apply it on here, and then, well, I'll show you how to spread it in the next step. For this here, first I typically work with the GPU heatsink. I plop it on like so, and at this point, I mean it is flattened there, but it's going to be fully pressurized once we put the X clamp back on. I'm pointing out this oval shaped hole right there because you want to typically have that facing outwards towards the side of the motherboard itself. But you can get the X clamp easily onto one of the pegs. You should be able to get it onto a second one without much issue. And then for the last two legs of the X clamp, you're then going to want to do this to reapply it. You're going to want to do something like push down on the X clamp with one finger, and then while you are putting it back in place with the X clamp removal tool, you're essentially going to put it in about halfway like we did before when we were removing it, but you're also going to want to pull upwards and kind of push inwards at the same time. That way we're not going to be damaging the X clamp and we can easily plop it back onto the peg itself. And at this point here, as you can see, we now have the X clamp popped back on within a few seconds. So that's for the GPU. We can now work on the CPU a bit easier since that one is going to be taller. For the CPU heatsink, you're going to want to face it the proper way for airflow. So make sure you kind of face it properly like this. Then what I do is flip it upside down, put it on a flat surface. Then I flip my motherboard upside down and while looking at this from above, you want to line it up with the holes there just like that. So you can flatten it on, and from here, you can put the second X clamp back on here. Again, with the oval shaped hole, you're going to want to have that facing outwards, away from the console and to the side, just like this. And typically, since we had a little bit of trouble with this before, you can get this onto two of the X clamp legs. It's going to be best to put it on the ones inside next to the already installed X clamp, and then right here, just like before, you're going to want to come in with the X clamp removal tool, just like that, push down on the X clamp a bit, and then with the tool, you're going to want to kind of push a bit inwards and lift upwards and reapply it like that. You should have one more here, but if you've done this multiple times now at this point, this last one should be just fine. And there we go. As you can see, you are now able to reinstall the X clamps easily enough. So all the preventive maintenance for the console itself, at least in terms of cleaning and repasting, has been completed. We can now work on actually modding this thing. With our motherboard right side up, one of the first things that we should do is get our NAND programmer wired up, regardless of which one you are using. Now, I'm kind of going to glaze over this part here and speed up the footage a bit because there's nothing too fancy going on. But essentially, you're going to want to look for these headers right here. They're going to be the same across all FAT models. And now I'm going to put up some diagrams showing the wiring points for these, whether you're going to be using an X flasher or even a Pico flasher. As long as you use a NAND programmer, this will work just fine. If you want to adapt this to something else such as a NANDX or JR programmer, you're welcome to do that. Essentially for this process, what you're going to do, you're just going to take some isopropyl alcohol and clean up these points really, really well. Next up, I do recommend taking some flux, applying it to these points, and then tinning all the points with some nice fresh solder. At that point, once all the points have been prepared, you can then go in and solder in your NAND programmer wires.
Excellent. Now with all of your NAND wires soldered in, what you're going to do is take your NAND programmer and hook it up to the wires if you haven't done so already. We're going to need to connect this to our computer and get it all set up. I'll show you how to do that with the Pico Flasher as well as the X Flasher. You're also going to want to bring over a power supply for your console because you're going to plug your console into power. Do not turn it on. We do not have to turn it on for this process, but you must have it plugged into a power source so we can dump the NAND. Be sure to grab your glitch chip as well. Even though we haven't installed it yet, we'll go ahead and take the opportunity to program it while it's outside of the console, so it's ready to go for installation. So now over at your computer, you're going to want to download a few things to get this all set up. And as usual, I'm going to have everything linked down below in the description. First of all, we're going to want to come over to Octal's console shop, and we need to download his build of JRunner with extras. All you need to do is come over here, go over to downloads, and click on JRunner with extras. This should take you to the latest build available here, and wherever you find it, all you need to do is come down here and download the latest JRunner with extras zip file. Now, all you need to do is save this somewhere you can easily find it, like your desktop here, and once you have it available, all you need to do is right click and extract it into its own folder. It should give you a JRunner with extras folder, and now at this point, all you need to do is open up the JRunner executable. It should look a little something like this, and at this point, you are in. Now we do need to set up our NAND flasher, so this is where you need to decide what you're going to be using. Now again, as I said earlier in the video, if you're going to be using one of those legacy flashers like a JR programmer, a Nandex, a Matrix flasher, you'll kind of have to install that and adjust this to those flashers, but I am going to be covering the two flashers that I recommend here going forward, which is the X Flasher 360 and the Pico Flasher, both of which are compatible on JRunner. So first of all, let's go ahead and install the X Flasher if that's what you're going to choose to use. Now to set up our X flasher, this is pretty simple to do. All you need to do is take the device itself, hook it up to your computer through USB, and with some luck, it should hopefully just show up here. Now, just to be secure on this, we can also click on the X flasher option, click on install drivers, and say yes to this pop-up. Just hit extract on the X flasher drivers extract option, and now walk through the driver installation. There we go, we should have these two as ready to use. Hit finish. So at this point, we should be good. Our next option here is going to be Pico Flasher. And if you're using this, you will have to flash a firmware onto the Raspberry Pi Pico. The link for Pico Flasher, of course, will be down below in the description. But once you come over here to the GitHub page, all you need to do is go over to the releases section and download the latest picoflasher.uf2 file somewhere you can easily find it. Just like before, I've saved this to my desktop. Now at this point, you're going to want to grab your Raspberry Pi Pico and you're going to want to hold down the only button on there, which is boot cell, short for boot select. When you're holding down that button, you're going to want to plug in the USB cable to the device and to your computer. Make sure you're holding down that button before you hook it up to your PC and keep it held down. You want to bring up your drives and pay attention here, but once you do that, I'm going to plug this in and you should see a new device pop up. Once you see this here, RPI RP2, you can let go of the boot select button, but keep your device plugged in. All you need to do is open this up, copy out the picoflasher.uf2 file and paste it. At that point, it should close out, and that's all there is to it. At this point now, you can physically disconnect the Pico Flasher device from your computer and plug it back in normally. With it all hooked up, we can now open up JRunner, and as you can see, the Pico Flasher is showing up on here, confirming that we have been able to successfully flash our Raspberry Pi Pico, so we've now turned it into a NAND flasher for the console. So there you go, that's how you can set up either one of these flashers. Now, once we have everything set up within JRunner, make sure your X flasher is set to SPI mode physically. That's going to be the switch up top. You're also going to want to make sure that your cool runner is set manually in two places. There's going to be a switch on top of the cool runner that is going to have NOR or PRG or program modes. You're going to want to flip that switch over to PRG. 
Then you're going to want to flip the bottom switch over to fat since we're installing this to a fat console. When you hook it up to your flasher, if you're using the supplied cable, you're going to want to make sure the flat smooth side is facing upwards. Then hook that up to your cool runner chip if you're using the cool runner and hook that up to your NAND flasher. When you hook everything up, your NAND flasher should be recognized here and your cool runner chip should have a solid red light on it. Now once we have everything hooked up properly, we can go over to program timing file. We're going to stay in RGH 1.2 and we're going to be in the Falcon Jasper section. Now the selected timing files, well, the recommended ones are 18, 19, 20, and 21. And I do want to say here at the beginning, we're not focused on getting a good timing and boot up and everything for the console. So we're not really focused on if it takes five seconds or 20 seconds, we're focused on getting the console up and running. And once we can confirm it is up and running when and modified, we can then work on the timing here. So typically what we want to do is start off with 21. That's what's going to be recommended. So you can select the 21 timing file and click on program. Once it has been programmed, it should say SVC flash successful. And if that is the case, we can now close out of this. We're now going to disconnect our NAND flasher and we can disconnect our cool runner from the X flasher or NAND flasher itself. Before we install this physically in the system, also look on top of the cool runner and we're going to flip that switch back over to NOR, which stands for normal mode. That way we can actually use it to glitch and boot up our 360. So to remind you all, at this point, we should have our NAND flasher hooked up to our computer. The NAND flasher also hooked up to our console where we wired up our NAND wires and our console should be plugged into power. Do not turn it on yet, but keep it plugged into power. So with everything looking good here, I'm going to go ahead and click on read NAND, which we're going to do two NAND reads. And with any luck, let's have it check for our console. And our wiring is good because it was able to find our configuration, which for this specific console is going to be a Jasper. It might be a little confusing because it shows Jasper 16 megabyte Trinity, but that's just because they're going to use the same NAND type there. Either way, once it is connected and reading, just leave it alone and get two good NAND reads. All right, excellent. So it should look a little something like this. We should have our two good NAND dumps and it should say that the NANDs are the same. If you have any bad blocks, JRunner should automatically remap them, but either way, it's looking all good at this point here. So we're going to create an ECC. Now for this, we're going to go over here, make sure we're on the latest kernel version. Our console type is all good. Make sure glitch2 has been selected. And at this point, we can now click on create ECC. Once the ECC is created, click on write ECC. And it's now going to write over our first modified files to the console. Excellent. At this point, go ahead and disconnect your NAND flasher from your computer, disconnect your Xbox from power, and take it back over to where you were soldering. We're now going to work on getting all of our points prepped and getting our chip installed. Over at your console, you're going to find this top pin header right here, and we're going to be revisiting it. If you're freaking out that I don't have my NAND points soldered in here for my programmer, don't worry, I just did my recording a little bit out of order so you should still keep all your wires soldered up but we're going to be adding new wires to the mix if you feel the need to clean up all these points here with some isopropyl alcohol go ahead and do so now and add some fresh flux to this now we're going to prepare our 3.3 volt as well as our ground points with some nice fresh solder. Now do keep in mind this is going to be 3.3 volts because we're going to be using the Cool Runner chip for this. If you're going to be going a little bit out of the way here and using a different chip that requires 5 volts, you're going to need a 5 volt power source. Just keep that in mind. But if you're using the same chip as me, you can use a 3.3 volt source.
Excellent. Now we're going to be moving a little bit out of the way here, and this is going to get a little bit blurry, but don't worry, I'm going to correct it here shortly. We're going to be moving to this side of the board, and we're going to be hitting another point here for CPU reset. This is an alternative point, but I'm going to recommend using this one here. Right here, you're going to be looking for the R8C2 resistor, and keep in mind, this is going to be quite tiny, but go ahead, hit this with some isopropyl alcohol, put some flux on here, and we're just going to tin this with a little bit of solder. You're going to be soldering at the end of it here at the bottom, next to where it says R. Excellent. Now let's get this console flipped over so we can go ahead and prepare the other point underneath the console. Come over to this general area right here. You're going to look for this hole near the south bridge, and just below the hole, we're going to be looking for a point which is annotated as FT2R2. This is going to be the point we'll be using for our clock or CLK point. Now, I recommend this just because I've had pretty good luck with it, and I also believe this is easier to hit than the CLK point on the top of the motherboard, so do the same thing here. Clean it up real well with some isopropyl alcohol, apply some flux to it, and then tin it with some fresh solder. Excellent. Once that's completed, move over to this section of your motherboard, and we're going to be looking for the FT6U1 point. This is going to be our post point. So go ahead, do the exact same thing here. We're going to clean up with isopropyl alcohol, apply some flux to it, and then tin it with some fresh solder. We'll now need to flip our motherboard upside down, come over to this section here to the bottom of the X clamp, and we're going to be looking for the PLL point. Be careful, it is small and located next to a whole lot of other really tiny points. So just do the same thing here, clean it up, apply some flux, and then tin this with some fresh solder. Now real quick, this is also going to be the CPU RST point, the one I'm pointing out to the right of this, that is kind of underneath the X clamp's leg. I'm not going to be using this one. If you want to use this for whatever reason, you're more than welcome to do so. However, I'm going to still be using and recommending the resistor up top that we ended up preparing just a few seconds ago, just because I've had some better luck and experiences with that and less issues overall. It's also been recommended by some installers such as Octal, so again, I'm still going to be using the alternative point, but if you want to use the original point that I'm pointing out right here, feel free to do so. Our chip should be programmed, cleaned, and all prepared. Again, make sure it's in NOR mode and make sure it's set to FAT for those switches, but if you want to, you can take a little bit of flux and apply it to 3v3, ground, A, B, C, and D. We're not going to use E and F. Then just come in with your soldering iron, bring in some new solder, and apply it to all six of those pads. Then, once it's all applied, we can get it fitted into the console. My apologies, I wasn't able to record myself actually applying the chip here, but what you're going to do is you should have a little bit of double-sided adhesive that came with the chip. If you didn't get that, you can find an alternative there, but what you'll need to do is activate your double-sided adhesive, apply part of it to the top of the AV port right here, and then stick the chip on top of it. Now, do keep in mind, you're going to want to pay a little bit of attention here, because this does allow me to reconnect my programmer if need be to the chip to reflash the timing file, but you're also going to want to move it a little bit off so it's not going to be falling off of the right side. That way we're not going to be obstructing the fan connector and we'll have a little more wiggle room to work with for the wiring. All right, it's time for the fun part, the wiring. Now let's come over to this section and we're going to work on 3v3 versed for our power. Now if you want to solder the wire to the chip or to the motherboard, that's going to be completely up to you. But real quick here, I'm just going to show this once. To solder in the wires to the chip, it's going to be a little something like that. As you can see, pretty simple, pretty easy to do, and we're going to do that five more times on the chip. But the more fun and more complex part is going to be on the motherboard itself. Now, thankfully, this is going to be real up close and personal thanks to my microscope. But going back over to the motherboard, we're going to find our 3v3 point, just like that, and we're going to solder in our wire a little something like that, once we have applied some flux and such if needed. As you can see, I've already applied everything there, and it went in beautifully. So this is a perfect joint right here, 
not having any issues with it. Let's work on the next one. We can move over to the right just a tiny bit and look for the point just above the number 12. This is the point that I'm going to be using here for ground. Of course, you're going to want to take one of your wires and solder it in just like this. And we're done. At this point, just solder the other end of that wire to the GND or ground point on the chip itself. For our next point, we're going to hit the final top point if you're going to use the alternative CPU reset or CPU RST or D point on the chip itself. It's going to be the end of this resistor right here if you remember preparing this one. Now, I just want to show you all what I do here is I do take my wire, I solder it to the end of the D point here on the chip, and then I end up measuring it out before I cut it according to length. What I do is I kind of run it straight from the chip down on the motherboard itself and to the first heatsink. And then if possible, you're going to want to run it as close to both of the heatsinks as possible. So just keep it close to those two heatsinks and then run it over to that resistor. And once you have it kind of measured out pretty tight right there or as comfortable as you can get it, you can then trim this wire to length. As you can see, mine looks a little something like that. So I just go in, trim it, I end up preparing my wire, and then you can come in here with the end of it with your soldering iron and just tack it in like so. And there we go. It's as easy as that. Now, as a heads up, if you don't feel comfortable soldering to that resistor for whatever reason, you could use the CPU reset point on the bottom of the board, just underneath the X clamp here. If you remember, it's quite close to PLL. I didn't use it for this installation, but if you want to run your wire to this point and solder it in alongside and next to the PLL wire, you're more than welcome to do so. Next up, we've got our B point on the chip. This is going to be our clock or our C CLK point because we're going to now start moving to the bottom of the motherboard. So this is the one where I end up using the point that is underneath the south bridge right here. What I do is I do a little bit something like this. I end up getting the wire and I'm going to run it still low to the motherboard here, but we're going to be looping it through one of these south bridge holes. As you can see, I ended up threading it through the hole closest to the heat sink right here, and you're going to want to then kind of play around with making sure it's not super, super tight, so it's not just floating in subspace here, but you're going to want to get it to at least a comfortable level of slack and such. I felt pretty happy with this right here, so once I was okay with that top length, I then flipped over the motherboard, and at this point, you you can then kind of bring it over to that point that we're going to solder to and then cut it to length and trim the end of the wire to prepare it to solder to that point. As a reminder, this is the FT2R2 point closest to that hole that we just threaded it through. So you're going to bring the wire to this point right here, make sure you have a little bit of solder at the end of your iron and tack it in like that. There you go. As you can see, we're done with that. We only have two more wires to go. The next one I'm going to be attacking is going to be the A point on the chip, which is going to represent PLL. Once you have this wire soldered into A, if you choose to solder to the chip first, we're then going to bring the wire over, make sure you have a good amount of length on your wire right here. And what I choose to do is I thread it through one of the other south bridge holes, but I thread it through the south bridge hole, which is closest to the glitch chip. Once it has been threaded through, and you're happy with the top length, you can flip the console over and we're now going to locate our PLL point. If possible, you're going to want to run this up and pretty close to the X clamps here. However, you're going to see I do a little bit of a maneuver at the end and big shout out and thank you to Octal for this recommendation. What I end up doing right there is I'm giving this a little bit more slack because I'm actually going in with my wire and then I end up doing a little bit of a loop or a hook or a curve at the end so as opposed to just wiring it up directly to that point I kind of go to that point then overshoot it a little bit to generate a little bit of a loop remember that it's going to be this point from earlier there's going to be a whole lot of components here so once you end up finding it make sure this is the one that you want to tack your wire over to it should be the one that you have already prepared and then come in here with the end of your wire bring it over like so and then just get it soldered in 
and there we go we're done one more wire to go with that done i also take the opportunity real quick to secure this wire down with a few pieces of captain tape you could just do a little something like this and as long as it's staying in place you should be good here for our final wire this is going to be the c point on the chip which is going to be for the post point again if you're going to be hitting the wire to the chip first feel free to use that but it should be pretty obvious there's just going to be one final one which will be c as long as it's looking good there we can now work on getting a long piece of wire and we're going to be threading it through the same hole that we just threaded the last wire into the one that's going to be closest to the glitch chip but that's also going to be pretty close to the south bridge right here now this is the wiring route that i took here i had both of these wires pretty close together at the beginning and then once we got about halfway through this first x clamp i end up breaking the post wire apart and I had it end up going between the two X clamps and underneath a couple of legs to get to the shortest way, I guess you can say here, to the post point. This is what worked for me. If you want to play around with other wire routing, you're more than welcome to do so. But again, I just took a few pieces of captain tape and started securing it down. Now that we have it nice and secured, I have the wire measured out to length here. I then ended up preparing the end of the wire and we're just going to get it to that final point to solve it into post again this is going to be ft6 u1 but you're just going to bring in some solder on the tip of your soldering iron and tack it in like that and at this point congratulations you are completely wired in your glitch chip is all good to go so now i would recommend before we get this all prepared for the final steps go ahead and grab some q-tips as well as some isopropyl alcohol and clean up all the points that we solder the wires to my final wiring that i used on the bottom of the motherboard looked a little something like this here and on the top it looked a little something like this as you can see for the cpu reset wire i ended up like i said keeping this pretty close to the heat sinks and made sure it was secured down so now what you'll need to do is grab your nand flasher if you ended up disconnecting it and make sure it is connected up to the nand wires that you should hopefully still have soldered into your console we need to prepare our console for booting because we're going to finish the rest of the glitching process but you'll just want to connect up your fans put them something like that there and hook up the rf board now we're going to bring our console over to our PC. Make sure you can connect to the NAND programmer like before, and also make sure you can plug in your console to power, because we are going to need that. By the way, you should also now plug in your system to a TV or monitor, and you have permission to turn it on like this. As you can see, your chip should be blinking, and your console should light up green. If it does, congratulations, we are in a very good spot. If your console is working properly, you should get a blue screen like this, which is going to be Zell Reloaded. And this here is going to contain our information that we need, specifically the CPU key right here. So what we can do at this point is we can take that CPU key value and we're going to type it manually into JRunner. Or if you have your console available on a network and you could hook it up through ethernet, go ahead, plug it into ethernet, turn on your console, and then you should be able to get an IP address showing right here and we can easily pull back the CPU key without typing it up. So go ahead, keep your console on this screen, and let's move back over to our computer. Over at JRunner, you will need to type in your CPU key, or if you're going to do this over the network, put in your IP address. So mine specifically for my console is 192.168.86.37, I believe. And once you enter in your IP, if you're doing it over network, click on Get CPU Key. And some really awesome stuff should happen here. We should have our CPU key already populate. It is going to move around a bunch of files, so it is going to show our serial number. It's going to show our KV info right here, meaning that we have been able to decrypt our NAND successfully. So congratulations, we are at a fantastic point right now. Since we've been able to get the CPU key, go ahead, turn off your console, and we're going to focus on JRunner again. Again. Over at JRunner, make sure your console is off, plug everything back into your NAND flasher, and we're going to work on the final steps here of getting this set up. So for here, again, make sure Glitch2 is showing up, 
and enable SMC+. This here is optional, but it does help out as you can see here, increases the glitch timeout to the maximum possible, and recommended for RGH 1.2 as well as SRGH. So it's certainly nothing bad here. Now quick note as well too, if you're not able to get your KV info and such and you're entering in your CPU key, double, triple, quadruple check that you're typing it in properly. If you're typing in your CPU key and you're not able to continue on and have the KV info, that means you're typing it wrong. And every time you type it in again, just click on reload and it should be able to reinitialize. But either way, once we have everything set up for Glitch 2 and SMC+, Plus, click on Create XE Build Image. So there we go. It should automatically populate load source with a UPD flash file. That is going to be our modified retail image, which is what we need. So at this point, for our final step, click on Write NAND. And for however long it took to read your NAND, it's going to take the same amount of time to write it back. And there we go. We've been able to write it back over. So from here, again, disconnect your NAND flasher from your computer, hook your console back up to a screen, and turn it on. And here we go. With a little bit of luck, mine was able to instaboot, thankfully, but we should be greeted with the standard Xbox 360 boot screen here. And if it's booting up successfully, then congratulations, you've been able to successfully modify your console. This is great. At this point as well too, even if you want to make sure it is modified, I mean if it's booting up right now with everything we did, it is, but we can go ahead and turn off the console. So I'm just going to do that here, turn it off, and then turn it back on, but boot it up with the eject button. And as you can see right here, we have Zell Reloaded which this is exactly what we're looking for. Now it's going to look a little bit different when we get to this screen and that is totally fine, but congratulations, at this point you've been able to successfully RGH 1.2 your system. So now we can go ahead, turn the system back off disconnect it from your power, your monitor, everything, and move back over to, well, wherever we're going to be working on our soldering. For some final steps here on the software side of house to keep your files and everything safe, what you want to do is you want to navigate over to your JRunner directory. You can find where this is at within load source and navigate to it, but let's go ahead and I'll show you where it normally shows up. Typically within our JRunner folder, there's going to be a new folder here that's going to be a series of numbers. That's going to be your serial number for your specific console. Inside of here, you're going to have several files, which these are all important to keep, but you're going to have your checksum to, well, verify everything, your CPU key, your fuses, your glitch ECC that we created, KV info, the original retail NAND dumps, as well as the modified retail NAND that we were able to build. These are incredibly important files and you want to keep them somewhere safe and backed up and accessible. That way, if anything ever happens to your console, like for example, if you're updating your system and you flash over a bad NAND or a corrupted NAND to it, or maybe you run a bad piece of software that impacts your NAND in some way, and really if something happens to your NAND, if you mess it up somehow or if it gets messed up, what you can do is you can easily take apart your console, hook up your NAND flasher, and reflash the UPD flash.bin to get it back to that working modified state. Or if you ever need to go back to complete retail, you can flash over NAND dump one or two. Now that is to say it is possible to recover your system without these files, but it is more difficult. And look, we have them here. Let's just go ahead and back them up. And for that, you can just take this series of files. You can put them into an archive, upload them onto cloud backup, whatever you need to do, but make sure these files for your specific system, these are individual per system, make sure they are backed up and safe in case anything ever happens. So here we go. What I like to do here is once this is all completed, I go in, of course, I unplug power. I unplug this from my monitor or my TV. You'll also want to disconnect your fan, disconnect the RF board, and you can also now work on disconnecting the NAND programmer because we no longer need that soldered in at this point. So we can physically disconnect it from the console and all those NAND wires you can now desolder as well. You're still going to want to keep the glitch chip soldered in, that's going to have to stay there. However, for the actual wires for the NAND, we're going to disconnect those. Thankfully, this step is not all too hard to do. Really, all you need to do is come in here with your soldering iron and touch it to each of the wires and desolder solder each wire. Once all the wires have been desoldered, at that point you can go in with some ice rope alcohol and some q-tips or even a old toothbrush and clean up all of the NAND points that you had just desoldered the wires from. We want to make sure everything is clean before we really start closing this system up. 
So now we can work on mostly rebuilding the system. Don't buckle it up completely because we might have to do some final tweaks on here. It's really going to be up to you and up to your system. But at this point, if it is booting up successfully, we're in an extremely good spot. So now you just want to take your motherboard, drop it into your chassis like so. Make sure it pops in there properly. And then what I like to do is grab the RF board and pop it into the front of the system. Once that is connected, you can then flip it upside down and we're going to screw all the screws back in there. We're going to screw in all the T8 screws, so those black ones, and we're going to screw in the T10 screws, the small ones, not the big ones. Super important, but definitely make sure you connect your fan. Don't just pop the fan in there, make sure it's connected as well too. You just got the system up and working, you don't want to have it overheat. Go ahead, pop on the fan shroud as well too, and for our final piece, we're also going to drop in the DVD drive. So it's pretty much going to be all the components except for, well, the casing itself and a hard drive. We don't need those just yet. From here, with everything connected, make sure you plug your system into power and into an AV source and and pop it on. If it comes up like so and it starts flashing green, congratulations, you've been able to rebuild your system and it's working just fine. If you're happy with the timing on here so far, like you're not having to wait a minute for boot up times, then you should be good to go and you can continue on with closing up the rest of the system. However, if you are not happy with the boot up times right here, you can go in with your NAND flasher and you can actually connect it directly to the glitch chip itself and reprogram the timing file on there. You do not have to solder it again, you do not have to hook it up to your NAND, you would be reprogramming the glitch chip within JRunner. However, again, that's going to be optional, and if you are happy enough with the boot up times right here, then you should be good to go and you can buckle up the rest of your system. Once you have your console partially reassembled, so you have it back in the chassis and you have these screws screwed in and such, that should be how the console is going to be booting normally. Now, this is where if you ever want to reflash your timing files and such, you can do this. And I will say the only reason why you should really do this is if you're not happy with your boot times. Now if your console is booting up within 5-10 seconds that's totally fine, like 5 seconds is an insta boot, but let's say if your console is taking 20-30 seconds, this is not booting reliably every time, it's taking a minute to boot up, then you might want to try and play around with the timing files. So to do this, you would take your NAND flasher, hook it up, and then you would also hook up your NAND flasher not only to your computer, but to the glitch chip itself inside of your console. You would then come over to Program Timing File, and from here, you would go to RGH 1.2, Falcon Jasper, and you want to play around with the timing files. Now, mine is already sitting on 21, and it works pretty well for me, but you might want to try 20, 19, 18, and essentially what you would be doing is you would select one of these, you would program it to the glitch chip, and then you would disconnect your NAND flasher from the glitch chip itself and try and boot up your console a few times. Now the result there would be that your boot times are decreasing and or your boot times are becoming more reliable. So this is kind of where you want to experiment with it. Now, if that doesn't work, you can try 19, 18. These are the recommended ones, and you can even try 22, 23, 24, 17. But again, if your console is booting, that's good, but now with it back in the chassis and reassembled, this is where you can mess around with it, and this is optional. If you're happy with your boot times, you're all good, you're done at this point. But if you wanna tweak it a little more, you can always come here and try to reprogram the glitch chip. I'd like to give another shout out to Octal for bringing this up to me to share with you all. If you happen to have a stubborn Jasper that isn't booting within a reliable time frame or reliably at all, and you've tried your hand at different timing files, you could also try to enable the cap here on the Cool Runner. 
locate these two points on your cool runner and bridge them together with some solder. Then try booting your console a few more times to see if that aids in booting. Although do keep in mind, if you enable the cap on the cool runner and run into some erratic cycles booting up your console, such as the chip blinking back at you in odd patterns or lighting up solid too early, you should remove the solder from those two points to disable the cap again. Octal has also mentioned to me in some cases with Jasper consoles, a 68 nanofarad capacitor would be recommended to use if the cap on the cool runner isn't great. He's provided this diagram to share, so if you're in a position where having a capacitor would benefit your install, but the capacitor built into the cool runner isn't great, grab a 68 nanofarad capacitor and solder one leg to each of these points on the chip. So, phew, alright, we're at the end. If you have followed along with your own system, congratulations. I really do hope you have a successfully working RGH 1.2 console. If you weren't following along and you were just watching for fun, that's awesome as well too. I hope you were educated, I hope you enjoyed this, I hope you got to learn something and you really liked the video in the process here. This was definitely a longer one to work on, but I do like to go in a little more detail with these RGH videos, just getting those nice, tight, clean close-up shots and everything. I feel like it helps out everyone, so that's always cool to see. Anyways, that is really about it for this video here. If you enjoyed it, a like would absolutely be appreciated. If you didn't like it, a dislike is fine as well too, because maybe you don't like these wires. And guess what? If you don't want to deal with all these wires, well, the next video I'm going to be working on is going to be RGH3 for fat systems. Don't worry, I didn't forget about it. It's just these videos do take a while to work on. They do take, I guess, a lot of resources here since I'm only going to be one person. And on top of that, it was important that I did want to get the RGH 1.2 video out first because, like I said, RGH 3 is still not going to be recommended for complete prime time for fat systems. Will it be improved in the future? Hopefully so, but regardless on here, we do have a nice solid modification with RGH 1.2. Anyways, that is about it for this video. Seriously, I've gone on long enough. I need to get some rest here. This is Mr. Mario signing off. Thank you all for watching, everyone.